Well, hey, it's Dan here. Uh, I've had the privilege this last week to be at what's being called the Asbury Revival at Asbury University. Uh, we're preferring to call it an outpouring or an encounter. It may lead to revival, which has societal change connected to it, and then full awakenings, which, which are sort of these massive movements in history. And so it's delightful to see what's happening, what's emerging there. Um, as a worship leader, I feel compelled <laughs> to bear witness kind of to what's happening, uh, bear witness to primarily what Jesus is doing, because that's who's doing this. You feel it in the room. The love of God is the theme. There's a sense of anticipation, but it's so sweet and it's gentle and people are on their knees in worship and prayer. It's, it's, it's bathed in worship. Worship is so central to just what's happening there. And uh, of course, it's it's deeply impacting Gen Z. It's being led in in many ways by Gen Z, and it is uh, truly uh, truly a pivotal time for the body of Christ. And campuses, I, I think I'm, I'm just taking a guess, but I think it's up to like 20 different campuses are experiencing across the U.S. at least. Uh, some forms of this happening uh, with them. And it's not just for Gen Z, it's for all of us, but there is a Gen Z uh, leading our emerging adults. And, and I get to be in, involved in work that connects all that together. Um, and it's just such a joy, such a privilege. But I just wanted to speak uh, with my fellow worship leaders for a moment about some of the things I think we can learn from what's happening at Asbury. I think there are some things not only to learn, there are some things to unlearn, and there are a few things for us to let be a holy disruption in not just the way we're doing things, but the why we're doing things. So I'm going to see if I can move quickly so that uh, this, is, this is short, but uh, I'm just going to move through these ideas, and there are seven of them. First is worship, leader, worship leadership is not first learned on a stage. It's just not. Our secret place is where we learn to be worship leaders. That is where we are trained to be worship leaders. And that's not sentimental or just a warm, fuzzy thought. It's, it's in reality, it is true. Learning to linger before the Lord with a song, learning to spend long time before the Lord alone where we're, we're singing, we're playing with our instrument before the Lord. You know, it, our first ministry is not to people. It is to the Lord. It is before the Lord. You can look at, you know, Second uh, Samuel chapter 6, this phrase before the Lord appears six times in the passage where David's saying he'll become even more undignified than this. He recognizes as a worship leader, we must all recognize through the New Testament, etc. Our first ministry is to the Lord in worship. It's where we learn to be responsive to the Holy Spirit. It's where we learn to listen. It's where we learn to tend to this dynamic interchange. And then worship leadership becomes an opening of that circle of love into a public space. And we lead from that secret life with an added layer of public awareness and community awareness and joining in with our brothers and sisters and creating a space of encounter for our communities. And that's the, the second idea I want to share that we can learn from what's happening at Asbury is spaces of encounter are the primary work of the worship leader. leader. They are not singing. It is not singing songs. It is not just leading the congregation in songs. Now hear me. I'm a fan of songs. I'm a fan of all the content in them. I'm a fan of their richness. I'm even a fan of just singing one song and it taking whatever, three minutes to four minutes and being done. What I'm not a fan of is when that's the point. That secret life spills over. Our primary job is to create places of encounter. That can happen in five minutes with a song led by someone who has that secret life that's then opening it for shared encounter. That can happen in five minutes. It can happen over 30, 40, 50 minutes. I used to worship in three hour uh, seasons where we just linger in the presence of the Lord. And, and, and what we're seeing here and, and what many others are doing and what we're seeing across campuses is a lingering in worship because encounter is leading. The mandate is encounter and you feel it in the room. Now that, that leads us to, to a few different things I think that are gonna, gonna maybe help us going forward here as we recognize that. And again, just hear me saying it can be a normal, songs in a service. It can be, but when the heart of the worship leaders oriented toward encounter, that one song, those many songs, 
They create a different atmosphere than when songs are being sung with a heart to worship, kind of reinforcing them and fueling them. It's different what I'm saying. Encounter is the goal. We set our radar on it. That's what we're seeking to do. It doesn't take a lot of talking in between. It doesn't take anything. It just takes a heart in the secret place. And, and in small groups where living rooms where there's either no one to impress, Jesus is the only audience, or there are very few, and we actually just want to meet with God together, you know, that's where it's learned, and then it moves into those wider spaces, and microphones and other things, and lyrics all are attached to it, bolted on, and serve it, integrate with it, and then it, it can lift it. We'll, we'll get to that. But the third one here is it's real or it's not. Now, what I mean by that is if encounters the goal, either our people in our congregation are engaged in worship. And again, I know this comes down to individuals and not it's not the whole congregation and sweeping sort of uh, hear me apply this, you know, with some nuance. Either the community is there to encounter Jesus in the worship music, in the song, or they're not. They're there to sing. And now there's there's, you know, it's a spectrum. As worship leaders, one of our mandates is to teach our communities, and as pastors, I believe. I was always a worship leader pastor all through my journey and continue to be in many ways. And, and our job is to teach people, uh, this phrase I love, songs are a place we go. They're a place of encounter. They're a place of meeting. We have to enter them as the songs enter us. Sometimes, in some cases, we have to linger in spaces for the songs to be able to enter us and become our language of prayer. That's not in every situation, but I do believe we need to create for our communities in ways that we can, uh, whether it's our church community or whether it's wider communities, spaces to linger before the Lord, especially in songs that nurture love, what we call in the, from the Wesleyan thread of our tradition, holy love, that nurture belovedness, which then overflows in love. That's what's happening at Asbury. You feel it in the room. We feel it with everyone we're, you know, we're praying for. I get to be part of the prayer team. And it's just, it's just beautiful what the Lord's doing. It's not that he hasn't done this before in other ways. Um, as my friend J.D. Walt says, it's just the Holy Spirit is just doing what the Holy Spirit always does, only it's getting amplified. It's a little more of it, right? It's, it's more even expressed. So it's real or it's not. We need to teach our communities about what it means to enter a song and let it become our language of prayer. Songs are a place we go. And, and I have some tools and ideas for that, but, and I know others do too. Uh, that can be done with a sentence. It doesn't always have to be done with a 30-minute sermon, though there should be some, potentially, at some point, some teaching that goes in uh, that's an investment in the worship life of the community. The next uh, idea here, the fourth one, is text serves. Tech serves, again, secret life, small life of the community, in the larger public life, whether that's hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands, right? And tech's job is to serve. At Asbury right now, it's a sound system um, in, a, in a big cavernous room. There are, um, and they've done good work on it, uh, but there are no lyrics projected. As long as sort of 50% of the room knows it, the whole room seems to know it, they're using a lot of familiar songs. So there's a roar in the room. The ambience uh, truly musically going on in the room is the sound and the chatter of the, the, the community in worship, right? And the dynamics of it. Now, let me just, just say this about something. Um, see if I can say it this way. Here's what's happening at Asbury. Here's the level of the music. And here's the level of the roaring congregation singing it. Now, it's a loud congregation. You know, there's always been these things. Of, no, we just need to hear the congregation's voice and this needs to be subject to it. Or let's just get them kind of here, you know, on par. Or let's just hear the human voice. Or let's go with, you know, <laughs> let's just power it through the music and let people just barely hear the person beside them. It, whatever. Here's what I think and what I see at Asbury. Again, I'm just bearing witness to what Jesus is doing and what I'm seeing um, elevated in worship and what I think many of us have seen ha has worked over decades and, and in a lot of settings. It's this. The music is enough to give it energy and to give it clarity. And the voices are, right, sort of rising with it. They're helped by it. 
And I think that happens even in acoustic settings. And I'm a big fan of just acoustic worship settings. But let's just say that text there to serve. And this, this is going to get into this next idea that is um, simplicity matters. We're serving the worship that's happening, but we're recognizing that we could pull everything away. And that's what's happening in Asbury. And it'd be okay. Oh my gosh, like we're actually engaging with God in worship. Sometimes I think it's even a necessity to get us back to this encounter life as a, as a community. But simplicity matters is this, is this next one. And this is simply about focus, guys. Right now, um, right now, most times in those worship sets, it's a piano, a grand piano. So it's got a little ambience to it, which is nice, kind of fills the fills the space, it, it provides that function. A guitar, a cajon to give it that, that inside rhythm and just, just keep the energy. Cajons bring energy, they equal energy. Um, so does inside rhythms of, of guitars, but then voices. And when you add the layers we're talking about, secret life to community life, small into widening that, etc. That's what's happening. We're being invited into these Gen Z kind of experiences in worship, that's what's happening. Um, and, and simplicity is leading. And so I'm not saying we don't have all the things. I'm just saying we can get fixated on that, put our energies all into it, where we leave these first areas I was talking about largely uncultivated, like they should be getting primary energy, your secret life in worship, our smaller, you know, these smaller dynamics of encounter, and then layer upon layer begins to build. We're majoring at times, and I, I see it, I see it, friends, and I, I know it from my decades now leading worship. We get fixated on the music, on the tech, on the arrangements, on the everything, and we've got to come back. You know, Matt said it, heart of worship, right? And that came out of something that was like that dynamic in, in he and Mike Pilavachi's world. And, and you know, we just have to keep it, keep the essentials, the essentials, keep the main things, the main things, right? Keep the major things, the major things. And not that the other things are just minor, but they serve it. So simplicity matters. And, and that kind of leads us as well into this next idea well, uh, just to say again, you know, eh, what you have is enough. Create an environment with it and get good enough on the instrument that we're playing them instead of them playing us. And we're creating these environments in, in the acoustic world. I think there's something that God is doing in, some, in a world that's so digital. I mean, you've probably heard, you know, they're asking everyone, at least for now, discerning for now, um, that we're just asking you, you know, take photos and some short videos, but we're not live streaming this because this is incarnational. It's about the people being together and it's inspiring, moving people to do it in their own places. And that's where campus is. That's what's happening here. And uh, because there can be almost a voyeurism, like because I saw it, I did it and experienced it. We might taste it and tastes are good, but the meals are happening in communities uh, all over the place. And so, so in this sense, uh, simplicity matters. The next one is pro proximity matters. There's a whole science of proxemics with people that the closeness uh, of people matters. There's a density in the room. That doesn't mean we can always do that. We certainly couldn't do it during COVID, but there is a sense where everyone can hear one another in that musical dynamic, and there's a sweetness that's coming along with that. Uh, the, uh, the last one, because we could linger long on all these, right? The last one is, and I just wanna say this just, just because I hear all this language around it. And this is the way I wanna say it. Well-known saints are good. Making them celebrities is not good. When, when you hear language of there are no celebrities on the stage and you see it at Asbury, that there's no super well-known people doing their things so well. It's just the raw worship that's happening. And it's not that these musicians aren't good. It's not that it's not sweet, but there's allowance for things, you know, being a like guitar being a little out of tune or, uh, you know, some dynamic. It's just, it's just so authentic and real. We're good. Like we're in, we're worshiping, you know, and, and it is good. It's very sweet. It's very beautiful. There's this dynamic where people can shut down when they just see people that are so good at things before them and, and they don't, we don't always know what to do with it. And this is the thing I want to say is we don't want to demonize the idea of being well-known. The Lord lifts people up. 
As my friend J.D. Walt says, we don't have heroes in the faith. We have saints. That's what we have. And there are saints that God has lifted up who are being super faithful in their worlds, and we don't want to diminish that. And and there are also those of us who, who know how to work the levers and are working really hard to get exposure, and, and we've got to deal with a tension there as to what makes it authentic, what makes it good, what makes it, what are the lines, and only we can know those lines, right? But, but I would say you can, uh, for me, I can feel it. If I feel like, like, like someone is moving beyond just that well-known saint side, and I don't mean, you know, I get it with marketing and promotion, like I get all that stuff. And I think it can all be used by God, I truly do. What I think is the problem is that we make people celebrities. I mean, putting aside sometimes trying to make ourselves celebrities, get some, get into some values that the Holy Spirit might want to be unearthing through what's happening at Asbury. But, but we can move into a place where we're, um, we're not celebritizing people. We're not making them our sole point of reference so that we recognize that, that faithfulness is what God's looking for. And I think that's one of the beautiful things coming out of that. So those are seven things that I think we as worship leaders right now can learn from what's happening uh, at Asbury and in this Asbury revival. And I'm just praying that there is uh, just a, a worldwide movement of experiencing the love of God with great encouragement. I love how gentle and sweet it is and beautiful. And it's even in order in so many ways. But people are profoundly being moved and changed, especially Gen Z. Uh, it's just so sweet to see them them in the lead. And uh, it's a privilege to be a part of it. It's a privilege to serve in it. It's a privilege to to share some of the things with my, my fellow worship leaders uh, across whoever's listening, across uh, the miles, across the world. So blessings, peace and grace to you. And I'll do what I can to just keep contributing some things as I feel able. All right. Great love for you. I'm cheering us on. Thanks for leading people in worship, creating these moments and places of encounter. All right, blessings.